It is my personal hope and desire that today that you do not hear me in my words, but that you'll hear the voice of the Spirit through God's Word. Would you pray with me? Father, we are humbled to think what you've given, what you've sacrificed, the depth of your love for us, and what you offer us even in our future. Lord, I'm just a man, but you are God, and your spirit is here among us. Would you speak to our hearts? Would you show us more than we've ever seen or known before and how close you are to us, each one of us, and that you want to do something in our lives now. God, we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to, I don't do this ever, but I'm going to hold my notes with me, and I'm going to try to stay right close to it, because I have a tendency to chase rabbits, and I don't want to chase rabbits this morning. Um, I will tell you that this, there's two parts of this this morning, and they run deep in my heart today. I've spent a lot of time praying over this, a lot of time, praying for you, praying for us. And my hope and desire is that that God will speak to each one of us in the power of his love and in his grace. So it's about the resurrection, isn't it? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ has not just one, but it has two very powerful and life-giving truths for each one of us. I, I, I hope you catch that from the beginning. What does the resurrection communicate to each of us, to all of us? That's what I want for us today. The first one is probably one that you are most familiar with, okay? Oh, by the way, I'm going to ask you to do something. I feel like I have your attention. That's good. But I'm going to ask you if you would take your Bible and your cell phone and you lay it down, scoot it under your chair like that. Could you do that? You won't need them. I promise you, you won't need them. What I ask is that you would give attention to God and his word this morning, okay? I may walk up and down these aisles. I may move around you <laughs> because I want this to come to you today. So, two profound and powerful life-giving truths that come out of the resurrection, Communicated through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's the first one. Here's the very first one. God is a God of salvation. That's the first thing to know. That when you look at the resurrection, you go, oh my gosh, he is a God of salvation. He is a deliverer from death and he's a giver of life. That's seen in the resurrection. I want to give you just a few points from Scripture that, that show that that's what the resurrection does for us. First, let me start with this. That you and I, that we, and, all, and every person on the planet, including the generations that preceded us and the generations that follow, that 
that you and I, that we all combine corporately, are a race of sinners. Is that good news? No, that's bad news. We're a race of sinners. Sin is something that is known and experienced by each and every one of us. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God's glory, His worth, His standard for us, we have fallen short of that through our sin. We are a race of sinners. Secondly, the penalty for our sin is death. And not just physical death, but of a spiritual nature and ultimately eternal death. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin, and by wages, he means cost, the cost of our sin. There's a cost to it. The wages of sin is death. That's what, that, that's what God told Adam. The day you eat of this, if you disobey me in this, you're going you're gonna to die. You're going to introduce death to the human condition. And that's something that we're all familiar with. We see it every day, all the time. Death. For the wages of sin is death. But whoa, wait, hang on for a second. But the free gift, free gift, say it with me. Free yeah. gift of God is Eternal life. In, that's a very important part of this, in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, it's not automatic. It comes to us when we are in Christ and Christ is in us. That's that's a relational term that we walk with him, we know him, he knows us. So if we are in Christ, if we've experienced who he is, then we, we are beneficiaries of this free gift of eternal life. Our need, your need, my need, the reason for Jesus' death is as a substitute for each one of us. He took our place, right? He paid the wages. He paid the cost or the penalty of death for our sins. Okay, let's pause for a minute. What have we just stated? That the purpose and the power of his death was to procure yours and mine our own forgiveness before God. That is a very, very powerful thing. Sheet one. Okay. Now, I want to read a couple of things. I want to move on to the, to the resurrection part of this. And you won't, uh, you won't need this because I'll read it to you. Um, so this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if I can get there. There we go. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, here's a cool thing about, about chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. It's a long chapter. I think it's about 58 verses, and all of them are about the resurrection, what it accomplished, what the benefits are. It's worth you going home and reading it and getting the full picture. But I'm just going to catch a smidget of it. So here it is, chapter 15, verse 20. But now. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. We just saw that in the play a few minutes ago. A reminder. Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, what is that? First fruits of those who are asleep. Asleep is a euphemism for death. They have died, okay? And the first fruits is, is a picture of, of going out and harvesting. Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead, okay? Our resurrection is future and it's contingent upon his resurrection. He was the first, and our resurrection is in the future. We are the, he is the first fruits. Verse 21, for since by a man came death, what man? Adam. By a man also came the resurrection of life from the dead. What was that man? Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. We're in Adam because we're descendants, 
okay, of Adam. But to be in Christ is a relationship. It's to believe. It's to trust. It's to follow. It's to obey. It's to walk with him, right? For each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, he's the first one to rise again. After that, those who belong to Christ at his coming. Ah, those who belong to Christ, not just anybody, but those who belong to Christ, they are promised a future resurrection contingent upon his resurrection. Is that not what he says? Then comes the end. When does the end come? When he comes again. Hey, and this is a great time for talking about the second coming of Christ, isn't it? Because everybody's talking about that again right now because of the, the chaos in our world today. We're like, Jesus, come on. I don't know if we got it mapped out right, but we want you to come, right? It's, it's like, so it's a, it's a good thing to be talking about that. But this is what he says. Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. You know, that's what Jesus has been doing since the cross. He, he is taking back all the authorities. All the kingdoms of this world are becoming his kingdoms. They're falling before him. And ultimately, every, every opposing authority and rule, spiritual or otherwise, will fall. And this is what it says. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now hear this. Shh. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Death is God's enemy. Death is our enemy. But Jesus has done something about it. We're going to fast forward to the end of chapter 15, verse 54. But when this perishable... What, what, what is something that's perishable? What is that? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's something that's de de disintegrating, decaying, right? It's dying, okay? What is he speaking about here? He's talking about our bodies. He says, we have perishable bodies. He says, when, when this perishable body will have put on imperishable, he doesn't say body, but he's talking about an, an imperishable body, one that doesn't die, one that doesn't decay, degenerate, that's that future resurrection, a resurrected, redeemed body, a new body that's promised here. And then he says, and this mortal will have put on immortality. This mortal, what is that? That's temporal life. Will put on immortality. What's that? Eternal life. This all happens when Christ comes again. And then when this has happened, the saying that was written will be, Say, says, death is swallowed up in victory. Wow, what is that? Death, death in our life right now, what does it do? It parades around. I'm king, death is king. Everybody fears death. Death is going, I am the champion of the world, right? Until, until death meets Jesus. Because when death meets Jesus, it gets swallowed up. The victory that death thinks it has its hold over us. And by the way, if we jumped over to Hebrews, we find the, that the old devil has taken death and used it to his ends. But Christ also has defeated him and will defeat him. Okay, But here we have, once again, we have this, this picture of death being swallowed up. Death's victory is swallowed up by Christ's victory. And then he says this. Listen, listen, death, where is your victory now? Where's your victory now? Death, where is your sting? Sting, when you hear that, what do you think about? When you hear a sting, you think about a, anybody ever been stung by a bee, a wasp? I'm thankful, I'm scared to death of scorpions. I've never wanted to be stung by a scorpion. I've known people. But they come, both of them, they come with stingers, don't they? And they inject a poison in us, and that poison produces pain, right? Wherever it stings you, and you, you feel that pain radiating because the poison that's in there. 
what he's doing, he's giving us a picture. And he's saying that our sin is the poison, but death is the sting. When we sin, we are poisoning either ourselves or those around us. Jesus at the cross took the sting, the sting of death. In a sense, you and I poison Jesus with our sin. And he experiences the sting of death. But, what a picture. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ because he has swallowed up that victory and he has laid before us a greater victory. Okay. So, you may ask the question, well, what do we do about death then? What do we do about this sting, this poison? Because I feel like I still experience it in my own life, right? Glad you ask. Revelation 1.5 says this, Jesus Christ, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn from the dead, he's the first one to be resurrected from the dead, to him who loves us and released us from our sins. Can I just stop for a minute and say what should be obvious? God loves us. That's what he said. He loves us. Not because you're so wonderful and so lovable. But because he's wonderful and loving. And he transforms us into loving creatures. Doesn't he? And he released us from our sins. Released us from it by his blood. There it is. There's the antidote. There's the remedy for our sting, for that poison in us. It's the blood of Christ that was shed for us. Thank you, God, for such a remedy. Revelation 1.18 goes on to say, just as Jesus speaking, he says, I am the living one. I was dead. Behold, look at me, he says, behold, I live forevermore. Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. That's who he is. That's, 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 death is not a part of who God is. Life is. He's teeming with life. But he says, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. I have the keys. Do you know that God has a key ring? And I, there are multiple keys on there. I read through scripture, and it's always a symbol of authority. All right, But I see all these, these keys on there. And right here he says, I have a key uh, to, to death. I have a key to Hades. I have a key to the kingdom. I have all these keys that he says. But you know, I start stopping and looking. I, I kind of looking at his key ring, and I, I notice some other keys on here. And I start looking. I notice there's some names on them. There's a key to your heart. There's a key on here to your heart. Key on here to your heart and to your heart. And oh my gosh, there's a key to my heart. Scripture says that Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. And if it's locked, he wants to use that key. To open it if we'll let him. Try it. He's trying to jiggle it in there and we're like, Moving around. I don't want that key in me. I don't want to open up my heart to him. I hope that that changes. Guys, is this not fantastic news? <laughs> this is awesome, wonderful news. But I have to warn us. There is an alternative reality than this one that we've been looking at. And it, I would be doing us a disservice and God an injustice if I were not to take a moment 
and speak of that for which we don't like to think about or talk about, but we would not understand rightly what he's done for us if we don't stop and pause and see this. This is in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Did you know that there are books in heaven? God has a library shelf full of books. I don't know what all the books that he has, but I know that he has this book here. I know that he has a book uh, of life, the Lamb's book of life. And I know that he has a book of deeds, our deeds. Your deeds and my deeds are recorded in his books, okay, how we've lived our life. This is what he says. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and Hades, which he has the key to, gave up their dead which were in them. And there they were judged, every one according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's a reality that none of us have to experience, need to experience, ever want to experience. We don't want the world out there to experience. Even the heart of God, the Father, doesn't want that. Okay? That's all I'm going to say about that. But, but today, we're here to talk about Something much greater. Oh, and I, and I should just say, let me, let me round this, this up with, with, uh, with Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In, in him, in Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, that's what we've been hearing, this message of the truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. What is the first thing that we learn from the resurrection? That God is a God of salvation. And here it is, the gospel of your salvation after listening and also having believed, you were sealed in Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. God promises that the resurrection is in the future. Heaven is in the future. All of those things are in the future, but right now, I'm promising you that, but in order for you to believe and trust in the promise, I'm going to give you a pledge, a down payment of your future inheritance, and what that will be is my Holy Spirit will come to live within you. And that's a powerful thing, to know that, experience that, and to walk in that. Okay. That's the first one. I said there's two. Two things that the, that the resurrection reveals to us. First, that God is a God of salvation. But here's the thing that... I want the whole world to know. First one, I want the whole world to know. But this one, I really want the world to know. I want, I want Christians to know. I want would-be Christians to know. I want those who who struggle with believing. I want all of them. I want everybody to understand this one. And that is this, also comes out of the resurrection, that God is a God of second chances. Second chances. Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection was in itself offering humanity a second chance. Wasn't that what it was? Think about it. He didn't have to come to earth. He didn't have to walk among us through our cesspool of of hate and violence and and lying and cheating and adultery and sin and and everything else that we encountered. He didn't have... 
I don't want anything to do with that mess down there. It's chaos. But he came. He didn't have to. He didn't have to die on a cross. Nobody forced him. He wasn't under any obligation to have to do that. When we messed up this, our lives and this world that he created, he could have said, that's it, I am done with man. I'm moving on, I'm going to create a different species, something else, and I'll start there again. But that's not what he did. He unveiled a plan designed to give us a second chance. Is that not what he did? Not only did the, the Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection offer humanity a second chance, his death, burial, and resurrection is a template for all second chances. Think about that. You know what I love about the Bible? What I love about the Bible is just how brutally honest God is and, and the Bible is, and, and how sheer transparent he is. He doesn't try to whitewash anything. He doesn't cover up any scandals in the Bible. It's it just, it just there for us to see it all. The ugly, the dirty, everything. If I had been God, and I had written the Bible, first of all, it would be systematic. It would be Every topic would be one chapter, and then there would be this and this and this. It would have been easy, you know. I wouldn't have to chase over here, there, and yonder to develop a theology of anything, you know. Um, secondly, I would redact a lot of things. I would edit it down to just, I would edit out the things that didn't make me as a God look, look good because some of my followers are out there doing horrible things, yeah, you know. I would just put the success stories in there. You know, that's the way I would have written the Bible. But one of the things that testifies to me the, the authority and the validity of its truth is that, that God's not worried about his reputation. He's worried about us. And so he lets us see it all. He just pulls back the curtain and lets us see it all right there in the Bible. And as we read some of these things, I think that what he intends, what he, what he wants is that we are able to read these stories and see how people failed and the mistakes that they made so that you and I wouldn't go and repeat them. But not only that, if we do, and we often do, repeat the same stupid stuff, stuff that hurts us, poisons our lives, all that, but that we would also see how God gave second chances again and again and again. That God is in effect a redeemer. He is a God of second chances. If I, if I could, I think if, not I, but if you could distill Christianity down to a single doctrine, some might say it's love, and I would agree with that. But maybe something that sets it apart, that distinguishes it so much. I think it's the doctrine and the experience of forgiveness. I don't think there's anything else in any other religion like it. That Christianity has, the, has God coming down to us. Every other religion seems to be like climbing up to him somehow. But God comes down on our level Here's what I want you to know. Every act of forgiveness is an offering of a second chance. Think about that. Every act of forgiveness. Isn't that what it is? Yes, Bo, you messed up. I forgive you. Let's start again. That's what forgiveness is. Second chance. If God gives us second chances, we should give others second chances. 
He laid it down for us. This is the way I want you to live. Give others second chances. One of the disciples came to Jesus one time and said to him, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven times? That's a, that's a good number, Lord. I would imagine there was more to the conversation than we find read in Scripture. I would imagine Jesus would have said, how many times do you want me to forgive you? Seven times? Jesus says, not just seven, but seven times 70. Oh, the legalist among us would go, oh, seven times 70, that's 490. 490. So only 490 times. Okay, I've got it. I'm going to keep a, an account of all the sins. And when you get to 490, that's it. We're done. Yeah, right? Well, forgiveness is a bedrock doctrine and practice of our lives. We're a forgiven people that should be forgiving all the time. I'm going to end this morning on two things. I'm going to share a parable with you and a story. The parable comes from Luke chapter 15. It's called several different things. I'm just, I'm not going to title it. Luke 15 verse 11. There was a certain man who had two sons. And why I'm sharing this with you, by the way, is to show you a parable that speaks to the power of second chances and the story also of second chances. So here it is. A certain man had two sons, he had a, and his younger son came to him, was, was kind of impetuous, had a little wanderlust in him and everything else, and, and he said, Dad, Father, Father, give me. Give me my inheritance now. Break up your state. Let me have what, what rightfully belongs to me. And, you know, I, I'm sure that the father was, Ugh, you know. He said, okay. He brought his two sons in and he divided the estate. It says, not very long after that, the younger son decided to load up everything that he had, all that money. Hey, he's rich now. And he's going to hit the road and he's going to go on a journey and he goes into another country. I imagine that the heart of that father was set on edge. But there he goes. And while he's there, it says that he squandered his whole estate. He wasted everything that he had on loose living. And you can imagine what loose living is. That's it in the Bible right there. Loose living. Okay? Um. It's a lot of fun when you got a lot of money, but when it's gone. It says that he spent everything that he had, and all of a sudden he was empty. He was still in this place, and there was a famine in the land, in this country, and all of a sudden he had no place to, to stay. I can't stay at this hotel. I can't get a bite to eat. My sandals are wearing out. There's nothing. And so he gets desperate. Hunger will do that to you. It? He gets desperate, and he, and he finds this man. He says, sir, I'll work for food. You know, I'll, I'll work for pay, or I'll work for food. And, and the man says to him, okay, you see that field out there? You see all those, those swine, those pigs? I want you to go out there and feed them, care for them, tend to them. And so he goes, okay, I'll take the job. And he goes out there, and he's wandering around in the mire, in the mud and excrement and everything else from these pigs. And they're just rooting around. And, and he begins to... It, you know, you know what sin does to you? It promises what it cannot deliver. And it leads you to places you never thought you would be. 
And here he is now. This kid that had so much, was having so much fun. Now he's at his worst. He's at the bottom. He's in a pigsty, a slop. And he is actually hungering for what he's seeing the pigs eating. If I could just have what they're eating. See, he didn't get a two weeks advancement on his job. He's going to have to work to get to buy his first meal. Or he can get down on his hands and knees and he can eat right along with those pigs. And then something amazing happened. It says that when he came to his senses, ah, his senses, what's that? He came to his senses. What had been leading him up to this time, before this time, wasn't his senses. It was his desires and his feelings, his emotions. The desire of his heart, the desire of his flesh. I want to live. I want to have fun. I want to experience this. I want to experience these pleasures. And, I'm, and he's, he's chasing that. And that has led him to this spot that he is in now. This predicament, this situation, these circumstances. This is what my choices have created for me. This is the end of that road. These choices led to this. How did I get there? I followed the desires of my flesh and what I, in my feelings I wanted, what I thought would deliver, and it brought me this. But then he comes to his senses, and he's a, there's an awakening, a realization. There's something better here. What is it? He actually, his, his mind and his heart go back to home. And he begins to think about, he begins to think about his, his father. And actually how loving and compassionate and wise his father was. And he thought, maybe, maybe my father will show mercy. Look how not only he treated me as a son, but he treats how he treats his servants. He remembered they always have bread. They have a roof over their head. They have everything that they need. He treats them so well. And, and he, he's going through the motions, what this is, it, the emotions of repentance. And by the way, if you don't know by now, this is, not a, this is a story of the Heavenly Father and not just a son, but sons and daughters. That's what this parable is about, the heavenly father. We're seeing a picture of our God, that he has the heart of a father, and that that son that left shows us what we can be like, that we can run from God and where it will take, but, but we're seeing what the heart of God is coming back. And here he is, he's beginning to think, I could go back to my father. And I know what I'll tell him. He, th he thinks this through. I'll tell him, I'm not worthy to be your son. I'm not worthy to be your son, but if, you, if you'll take me back, just, just make me like one of your servants. That's all I need. And so it says that he, he got up his stuff and he just left and he started heading back. Can you imagine what he looked like in those rags? Smelly, dirty, filthy. And then it says this, the father saw his son in the distance. Saw his son in the distance. And as he was coming, the father, his heart melted and broke. And, he, and it says that he felt compassion for his son. And he began to run to his son. That's a picture of God. God runs to us when he sees that we're done with our sin, when he sees that we're turning back, when he sees that we're coming and going, is there a second chance? He's saying, yes, there's a second chance. You're my son. You're my daughter. And it says that he ran to him, and when he came to him, he embraced him and kissed him. And, and the son, just, all he can say is, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Just, just make me one of your servants. Lord, will you receive me back and just make me a servant? 
And, and he says, forget that mess. That's hogwash. You've been in a hog pen. That's hogwash. And so he, he begins to tell the servant, go, bring him some clean clothes. Put a ring on his finger. Go f- slay the fatted calf. We're going to have a celebration because my son was dead. Dead. And now he is alive. He was lost, but now he's found. We have to celebrate this. Powerful story. There's a little bit more to the story. His brother, his brother comes in and goes, what's all the commotion? What's going on? Oh, your brother's back. My brother's back. What, that heathen? Yeah, he's back. And your father's putting on a party for him. What? What? How could he do that? And he runs and finds his father, and he's angry. Father, why'd you do this? You've never thrown a a shindig like that for me. And he goes, son, everything I have is yours. You've always been with me. I love you no less, but your brother was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, now he's found. What else can we do but celebrate? Guys, I don't know a more profound picture of second chances than this parable right here. This is a God of second chances, the story. I'll try to go through this quickly. Peter. God chose many disciples, but he chose 12 to be apostles. And he chose Peter to be like Top dog, (laughs) okay? I'm going to, when I build my church, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. There's another key. And you're going to lead into these mission fields, okay? You're going to do this. Where Where did Jesus find Peter? He's a crusty old fisherman, right? Walking along the beach one day, he's out there fishing with a couple of other dudes. And and Jesus hollered him, hey, catch anything? No, horrible night, not a thing. Throw those nets on the other side. <laughs> oh, our fish are going to swim over to the other side. They've been on the other side all this time. Throw them over on the other side. They throw it over at his bidding. So full, the nets start to break. They come into shore amazed at this miracle. And Jesus is sitting there, and he makes them a meal. And he looks up at Peter, and he says, Peter, follow me. And I'll make you a fisher of men. He dropped his stuff and he followed Jesus. Now, everything that you know about Jesus, or, excuse me, about Peter is true. Impetuous, proud, arrogant at times, violent at moments. He's the guy that whacked off a soldier's ear at, after spending three years with Jesus and learning all about mercy and grace and everything else. Violence, we're going to fight back, you know. Uh, he's the one that jumps out on the water. I'll do it. I'll do it. Help! As he's sinking, you know, all all of those things. This is Peter. And yet, this is the one that Jesus chose. The the Last Supper before Jesus was taken. After he enjoyed that meal, he looked at, at all of his disciples and he said to them, he said, when they come and take me, you're going to all flee. You're going to run. No, no, we're not. They were all saying, no. Peter said, I will not. He was always the loudest voice. And he said, Peter, before a cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he denied it. He denied Jesus that in that, no, I will not. I will go with you. I will die with you. I will die for you. I will die with you. Fast forward. The night that Jesus has been taken and and there's pandemonium, there's a little chaos, and it's now it's settled down, and people are just in little huddles around a night fire, and, and, and uh, Jesus is somewhere in the area, chained up is kind of how I picture it, waiting for the next step. And Peter's there trying to watch out, and he's around the fire warming himself, and, and a few other people around there, and, and, and a girl says, hey, Aren't you one of those that was with Jesus? And he goes, no, no, not, not me. I don't know the man. Who are you ta- what are you talking about? You know, kind of 
trying to cover himself up a little bit more. A little more time goes by, and you know the story. Somebody else comes and says, says no, you're one of his followers. I remember seeing you. He, you talk like a follower of Jesus. No, no, not me, not me. A little bit later, a third time, somebody calls him out. And this time, in anger and something of his old life came up, his sailor's mouth. It says that he began to, to curse and rant. And he said, I don't know the blankety, blankety, blank. And at that moment, we didn't hear that, but at that moment, they heard, he heard a rooster crow. And when he did, it says he turned and his eyes locked onto Jesus' eyes. And he just broke and melted and he, he couldn't look at him and he ran and he wept bitterly. Now we fast forward from there. The crucifixion has happened, the death, the burial, the resurrection. And Jesus is appearing before people. You notice how every time, did you notice that even in the play, that they would say, go tell the disciples and Peter? Peter seemed to be lagging behind in all of this because he was going, man, I was there. I was with Jesus. I was his chosen guy, but I failed him. I've blown it. And, you know, he felt horrible, miserable, regrets, all that depression and everything. So, finally, one day, it says, you know what happens when we've really screwed up sometimes? You know what we do? We go back to the old life, don't we? We just go back to something familiar, something that's not good. So, what did he do? He went back fishing. So, he said, I'm going fishing. A couple of the guys said, I'll go with you. He gets out there on the, out there in the, on the sea, cast his nets out, nothing, same story almost. Jesus is walking along the banks, sees him, says, hey, did you catch anything? No, not anything. They didn't recognize him. Jesus had a way to make himself <laughs> not known, <laughs> okay? And that he said, throw your nets over on the other side. Same deal. Fish galore. And somebody yelled, it's Jesus. Peter jumps in the, the sea. Starts swimming back. The other guys row the boat in. When they get there, there's Jesus. Brown fire. Cooking fish. Come have a piece. Sit down. Rest. And after they're, they're eating and fellowshipping a little bit, I picture Peter a little off, not quite in that circle, just sitting over there looking down at his feet. Jesus gets up and walks over. He says, Peter, I've been wanting to talk to you. Peter, do you love me? Peter sits there. Yes, Lord. I do love you. They sit in silence for a little bit longer. and I don't know how long. Jesus says again, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. I love you. A little bit longer, a period of time goes by. Jesus says it one more time, a third time. Peter, do you love me? This time it says that Peter was grieved that Jesus had asked him three times. Like, you must not believe me. <laughs> I can understand why you wouldn't believe me after what I've done. Each time he asked him, do you love me? And he would say yes. He would say, feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. And the third time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Lead my sheep. What was he doing? For, yeah, for every denial, he was offering him an opportunity to reverse that. He was saying, you're still my man. You're still my guy. 
I believe in you, Peter. Second chance. We need second chances. We're going to play a song. It's called When God Ran. It's an old song, a favorite of mine, about this parable of the father's heart for his straying but returning son for a second chance.